It's been said that love can make you do crazy things. And I would wager to say that in the eyes of the world, love for Christ can make you do things that are even crazier. Today, we're going to be looking at the life of Paul, and we're going to see a man who is tenacious, a man who has perseverance, and a man who does things that seem, from the world's point of view, crazy because of his love for Jesus Christ. We've been taking this journey through the book of Acts, and I hope that to you it feels like you've stepped back in time almost 2,000 years to get into that first century mindset of what it must have been like mere years after Jesus Christ himself had lived, died, and rose again. It wasn't too long after the resurrection that we saw the upper room, and we saw the day of Pentecost, and we saw the Holy Spirit come upon the disciples. It wasn't too long after that that Paul himself was converted, known as Saul, going by his Jewish name, and eventually would go by his Roman name. Over the years, he grows, and he goes on missionary journeys. So far in Acts chapter 13, we've seen Paul and Barnabas commissioned as missionaries. The Holy Spirit set them apart. In Acts 13, verse 4, it says that they are sent out by the Holy Spirit. After they have been prayed over, they are sent out by the Holy Spirit. They are not working on their own, but they are empowered by the Spirit. They have been chosen by the Spirit, and they are now sent out by the Spirit to do the work of the Spirit. The Christian life is a life lived by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, and indwelt by the Spirit. Paul's first missionary journey begins, and they travel through to the land of Cyprus. This is a large island um, right off of the coast. Let's pick up in verse 13. Today we're going to finish off chapter 13 and get part of the way through chapter 14. Verse 13, now Paul and his companions put out to sea at Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. So Paphos was on the western coast of the island of Cyprus. They put out from there, they arrive in Pamphylia, which is the region, and then they head north um, after they land in Perga. But first, John leaves them. This is John Mark, Barnabas' cousin. He comes, but then he leaves. In a couple chapters, Barnabas is going to want John Mark to join them again. In Acts 15, verse 36, it says this, that... After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers and sisters in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul was of the opinion that they should not take along with them this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. Now it turned into such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark with them and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas. So there's a disagreement as to taking him back because of the way that John Mark had deserted them in, uh, when they left and when they, when they arrived in Pamphylia. Now, we don't know the exact reason why he left. Some people believe that maybe it was because he knew that they were going out into more of a Greek culture and he didn't want to go there because of the rising hostility and threats towards the, the Christians, but we don't know for sure. Either way, Paul did not see it as a sufficient reason to desert and to leave them, and therefore he didn't want to have him back. Now in Colossians 4, at the end of the letter, we see that Paul's heart has changed towards John Mark, and he instructs the believers to welcome him. Let's take a look at the journey so far that the disciples have taken. They set out from Jerusalem, and they headed north to Antioch. That's where they were commissioned as missionaries. Antioch is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And keep in mind that Paul and his companions, they're going to be doing a lot of walking on these journeys. So that's 300 miles. From Antioch, they headed to Seleucia, and from Seleucia, they sailed over to Cyprus. They landed in a place called Salamis, and from there, they walked to Paphos, which is about 100 miles miles from one city to the next. So they've walked 300 miles. They've walked more. They've traveled by boat. Now they walk another 100 miles. They set sail from Paphos up to Perga, and then from Perga, they're going to head north to Pisidian Antioch, which is another 120 miles. So at this point, they've walked 
uh, over 500 miles. And so maybe they're the ones that wrote that they would walk 500 miles and maybe walk 500 more. If they walked 12 to 18 miles a day, at this point they would have likely spent 35 to 40 days just walking the roads to tell people about Jesus Christ. They're willing to spend days and days walking to proclaim the word of God. Are we willing to walk across the street or across the office? Verse 14, but going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch. Now, don't get confused because they just left from Antioch and now they're in Pisidian Antioch. There are actually about 17 to 18 different ancient cities by the name of Antioch. And that name basically means a speedy chariot. Now, uh, speedy as a chariot. There's Antioch, which was 300 miles from Jerusalem. And this is Pisidian Antioch, which would have been about 800 miles away. This is a far distance to be away from home. It's almost the distance from here to Florida. But... To communicate, you have to communicate through letters. And to get there, there's not an airplane. It's a lot of walking, and it's a lot of effort. But it's worth it for the cause of Christ. They arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So in the synagogue, much like in our church, there is an order of service. For the synagogue, they would open up with a word of prayer. From there, they would have selected readings from what we know as the Old Testament. They called it the Law and the Prophets. The Law, the Torah, the the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and then from the Prophets. Now, we got to remember that what they considered to be prophets would have not just been the major and minor prophets, but also the history of Israel. We call that prophetic history. That's why if you read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, many times it will reference other books. It will tell you, if you want to learn more about this person, go read this book, because it's focused on the prophetic history of Israel. Israel. So you've got the law, you've got the prophets. Now the the law would have been divided up into about 53 to 54 parts so they could read one every Sunday and make it through all of the law in about one year. So they would pray, they would read and interpret the law, then they would read and interpret the prophets. And after that, someone would stand up and give an exhortation or a sermon. And so we can deduce what would have been written based on what Paul quotes in his message. It's likely that this was the 44th reading of the Torah, which would have taken place in July or August, which how cool that it winds up being here that we're preaching this passage in August. Likely it would have been Deuteronomy chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 1. So Paul and his companions, they come into the synagogue as was their custom, The law is read, the prophets are read, and then they get an invitation to speak. Paul must have been dressed like a teacher, or they must have sat among the teachers, or it must have just been the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But God orchestrated this, that Paul could deliver a message. And it says this in verse 16, Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, many times before An apostle gives a message, they motion with their hand. Peter motioned with his hand for people to be quiet, and that might be similar to what Paul is doing here. Let's take a look. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of the structure of Paul's sermon, and then we're going to read through it. I'll make a couple comments as we go through it, but we're largely going to let it set on its own. Paul's going to give an introduction. His introduction is very brief. He doesn't spend time making up a lot of jokes or trying to fill in time with things. He cuts straight to the chase. He gives a history of of Israel from Abraham to David. And then he continues on talking about the recent events that happened in what we know as the New Testament. Then he circles back to show how these events fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. And then he gives a call to repentance. Paul's message is going to include uh, liturgy, because there's readings. It's going to include knowledge, Old Testament, New Testament explanations of truths and ideas. And it's going to ask for commitment, a call to repentance. So Paul knows the scriptures, and he is prepared in season and out of season. Remember, Paul himself had been a Pharisee. 
He knew the law. He knew the prophets. He was trained. And in fact, we read not too long ago that after his conversion, he went and he spent three years in Arabia being trained by the Holy Spirit. And so he has been prepped and he is ready. And so with these passages being read, he stands up and he addresses the crowd. Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. Right there, Paul's getting into what we call the doctrine of election. God's sovereign and divine choice. In the Old Testament, we see that God elects and chooses Israel. He called out Abraham from among all people to make him a great nation. Abram was chosen above all others. His son Isaac was chosen above Ishmael. His grandson Jacob was chosen over Esau. It's God's sovereign choice. The God of Abraham is the God who elects. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. So here he's getting a quote from Exodus 1, which says the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. But he's also referencing what would have been read that morning in Isaiah 1, which says, Listen, heavens, and hear earth, for the Lord has spoken. Sons I have raised and brought up, but they have revolted against me. So he starts off his message referencing that passage from Isaiah, which was hearkening back to the Exodus account. Now, the Exodus account, that is God's great redemptive act in the Old Testament. In fact, about 80 times throughout the Old Testament, there's going to be this phrase, the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That is not only found in Exodus, but Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings, and on and on throughout. It is God's big redemptive act. It is a foreshadowing and a type of Jesus Christ redeeming us from slavery to Satan, sin, and death. Verse 18. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. So now Paul is referencing the other passage that would have been read, Deuteronomy chapter 1, which in verse 31 says, And in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son on all of the road which you have walked until you came to this place. So using those passages as a launch pad, he goes into his message. He's going to continue talking about the history of Israel and then Jesus Christ. Verse 19, when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Now, this quote here is like a mashup of two different passages, one being Psalm 89, verse 20, which says, I found my servant David with my holy oil, I have anointed him. And then also 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, which says, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him ruler over his people because you, and this is speaking to Saul, have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So that was a common thing that rabbis would do is they'd make a quote based on two different passages. Paul continues in verse 23. From the descendants of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that a shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Verse 24. After John had proclaimed, before his coming, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sand of whose whose feet I am not worthy to untie. 
This is almost a direct quote from John chapter 1, verse 27, where John the Baptist, when being asked if he is the Christ, he denies it. He doesn't take any glory for himself. And that's a, that's a theme that we're going to see uh, throughout this chapter here. It's giving the glory to God. John kept saying in John 1, 27, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. A servant would have untied the sandals. He's saying he's not even worthy to be a servant of Christ. What type of humility do we have when we look at our position in light of Jesus Christ? Remember, um, to worship somebody was to find the worth in them, and it was the idea of bowing down before somebody. Verse 26, brothers, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the declarations of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no grounds for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out everything that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. The resurrection is a fully Trinitarian work. Jesus raised himself from the dead. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. We see this in different passages throughout the Bible. Galatians 1.1 begins, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through human agency, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. It was God the Father who raised his son from death. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all time, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. It was the Spirit that made Jesus Christ alive. And lastly, Jesus prophesied in John 2, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Verse 31 And for many days, Jesus appeared to those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. Remember Acts 1.8, that's kind of the basis for this whole book. Jesus saying, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. They saw Jesus. They heard his teachings. They witnessed the crucifixion and they saw the resurrected Savior and they saw him ascend into heaven and now they proclaim that as his witness. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to our fathers. To preach the good news is to evangelize. It's where we get that word from. Are we preaching the good news? The good news is what we call the gospel. The bad news is that through sin, we receive death. The Bible says that all have sinned. And because of Adam's sin, that through sin comes death, and death spread to all men because all have sinned. And that when we sin, we earn what sin pays, which is death. Physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. We call that the second death, hell. But the good news is that Jesus Christ came down, lived a perfect sinless life. A life we could never live. He died on the cross in our place as a substitute to atone for our sins. He paid that price. He died, but he rose again three days later, conquering Satan, sin, death, hell, and the grave, absorbing God's wrath so we could have God's grace and we could have that gift of salvation and eternal life. That is the good news that they proclaim. We don't need to proclaim another message. It's that message. It's always the gospel that will save and bring a resurrection to dead spirits and make people spiritually alive. Preach the good news. Verse 33, that God has fulfilled this promise to those of you who are my descendants by raising Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. 
You are my son. Today I have fathered you. That's Psalm 2-7. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead, never again to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and faithful mercies of David. That's Isaiah 55, 3. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, and this is Psalm 16, 10, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served God's purpose and his own generation fell asleep and was buried among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, and through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, see the things spoken of in the prophets, that it does not come upon you. Now he's going to make a quote from the Septuagint's version of Habakkuk 1.5. Look, you scoffers, and be astonished, and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though some should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people repeatedly begged to have these things spoken to them the next Sabbath. They wanted to hear more, and they weren't just satisfied with one message. They wanted them to come back the next week to tell them this, the, more about Jesus Christ, more about the good news of the gospel. In fact, they wanted it so bad they didn't even leave Paul and Barnabas alone. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking to them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. So they not only wanted him to come back the next week and explain more, they followed him, and he kept teaching them, and he encourages them to continue in the grace of God. And that is what we need to do as well as followers of Jesus Christ. We continue on in God's grace. You see, we were saved because grace was preached to us, either from a person or through God's word. Then we receive the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ. After that, we are sanctified by God's grace. And God will provide for us through his grace, and he will persevere us through his grace until we are in heaven. Let's continue on in verse 44. The next Sabbath, nearly all the city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. So the population here in Pisidian Antioch would have been roughly about 100,000 people, they estimate, uh, for the first century because of the city and its surrounding areas. And the gospel is just like that. It's like fire. It attracts people. When you can get the whole town together because they want to hear the good news of the gospel, there's something spiritual going on there. And we're going to see some spiritual warfare but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul, and they were blaspheming. Do you remember it was the Jews who were jealous of Jesus that they put him to death? This was foreshadowed as early on as Cain being jealous of Abel and putting Abel to death. We knew that that was going to happen, and out of envy and jealousy... The Pharisees and the religious leaders put Jesus Christ to death, and now these anti-gospel Jews are still trying to put out that message. And here's the response. Paul and Barnabas, they don't back down. They don't say, okay, we see there's opposition. You don't really want to hear this. We don't want to offend you, so we're just going to go away. In verse 46, it says, Paul and Barnabas spoke out Boldly. This is confidence. This is courage. This is assurance. They were willing to take the risk. They knew the risks already. They had already been hounded. They had already seen what happened to Jesus. But they took courage anyway. Instead, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you. First, since you repudiate it and consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. This is a major moment in Christian history. Up until this point, the Bible has largely been about the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. But now we're going to see things turn to the Gentiles. You see, Jesus prepared the people for this through many of his parables. We read one earlier, the parable of the great banquet. Those who had been invited, well, those were the Jews. 
And they were the ones that found excuses not to go. But those who were sick, crippled, lame, and on the highways and the byways, that's the Gentiles. That's most of us in this room. And so Jesus, in many of his parables, prepared people for the fact that the gospel was going to go out to the Gentiles. That's part of the message of the the parable of the workers in the grapevine, right? That that many of the workers, some came early, some came late, but the ones at the 11th hour, they receive the same reward as those who start at the beginning of the day. And we get the same inheritance as those who believed from early on. Paul, in Romans, he will go on to explain in great detail the gospel going out to the Gentiles. In fact, Paul will call himself the apostle to the Gentiles. Verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have appointed you as a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. This wording is very reminiscent of um, a prophecy that was made over Jesus as a baby in Luke chapter 2. Now let's continue in verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. So many times in the book of Acts, we see that the response to God's word being proclaimed and salvation taking place is joy. It's rejoicing. That's why we come together on Sundays is to rejoice and to praise God for who he is and what he has done. We've seen over and over again the disciples rejoicing. Those being saved are rejoicing, being filled with joy. And here the Gentiles rejoice because now salvation's been opened up wide to them. It started off with the Ethiopian eunuch back in chapter 8. We saw an individual be saved. Then in chapter 10 we saw Cornelius and his household become saved. It starts at an individual, then a family, and now it's gone even wider. And now you and I are recipients of this great grace. Glorifying the word of the Lord. It's God's word that has power. And we need to stick with God's word. We need to know God's word. We need to study God's word. We need to memorize God's word. We need to proclaim God's word. When we're explaining Jesus to other people, we need to use God's word because that's where the power lies. They began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. You remember back at the beginning of Paul's sermon, he spoke about the doctrine of election as it related to the nation of Israel. And here we see the doctrine of election played out as it relates to the Gentiles, to the church as a whole. You see, Israel was God's chosen people, and now we see God's chosen spiritual people. Paul expands on this in Romans chapter 9. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. We don't need giveaways and gimmicks and programs. We need the word of the Lord. That's what spreads. That's what changes hearts and lives. Verse 50, but the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. So Iconium uh, is at a crossroads of different trade routes. Today it's got a population of about 50,000 people. Um, I'm not sure what it was like back in Paul's day. I couldn't find information on that. But we know it was a crossroads between a couple different trade routes. And if you notice, those are the cities that Paul is targeting. It's perfect spots to go on a missionary journey because if you can reach people in these cities, they're going to influence people who are coming and going, and that's just going to continue to spread. Many times throughout these uh, missionary journeys, Paul is stopping in the major cities to proclaim the gospel, and he's bypassing the smaller rural areas. And that would be akin to us here in Hagerstown and then going down to Baltimore or going down to D.C., going to Frederick, places like that, to proclaim the gospel because we're going to cast a wider net and we're going to catch people coming and going to different places. 
So they go to Iconium, and it says in verse 52, And the disciples were continually filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Are you filled with the joy of the Lord and the Holy Spirit? You see, there's two baptisms. One is of water, but one is of the Holy Spirit. And when you are saved, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, but you must continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to have joy, that is a fruit of the Spirit. Chapter 14 In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together. This is the custom to go into the synagogue first before proclaiming outside the synagogue. We saw this when they went to Salamis and and Pisodia Antioch. We see it here in Iconium. It's going to happen in Thessalonica. It's going to happen in Berea, Athens, Corinth, Macedonia, and eventually it will take place also in Ephesus. So this is the third out of 11 times that we see Paul or his companions start off in a city by targeting the synagogue. You see, this is where we need to understand how we present the gospel to somebody is important. Because they would target these synagogues because of the Jewish people in there who already had a base knowledge. You see, we need to understand the difference between a Jewish culture and a Greek culture. Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis has a great short book called The Gospel Reset. And it's all about this difference. You see, the Jews had a knowledge of God. They knew who the one true God was. They also knew about being created in God's image. They knew about the fall of mankind through Adam. And they knew about sin. And they knew about a Messiah. The table was set. The stage was set. All they needed to know was that it's Jesus that came unfulfilled. They had that base knowledge, and so they're going into the synagogues. But later, we're going to see that Paul has a different method when he's reaching out to the Greeks and when he's going to places like Athens, because they don't know who the one true God is. They worship all sorts of different gods, so you have to start over from scratch. Here in America, we might think that we're more of like a Jewish culture that has a base knowledge of the one true God, but many people don't. If you ask people what a Christian is, some people will think that we are Jehovah's Witnesses or that we are the same as Mormons, right? They don't know, and so we have to be their tour guide through Christianity when we are reaching out to them and start at that base level of who God is because there's one true God, but there's many, many false demonic gods. And so people need to know who the one true God is. But here we see that they are going after those who have their hearts a little bit ready, right? Now, we want to be careful with how we talk about this because some people talk about those who seek after God. But in Romans chapter 3, Paul writes that no one understands and no one seeks after God. But we see that it is God the Father who draws people to himself. And those who are being drawn to him are ones that are becoming ripe and ready for harvest. When Jeremiah in chapter 29 said, seek me and you will find me, we got to remember he was already speaking to the chosen nation of Israel. So they go into the synagogues and they speak. They speak. There's that phrase that said, preach the gospel at all times, but when necessary, use words. But we need to always use words. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes through hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. And they spoke in such a way that a large number of the people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. The early church is a time of both mass persecutions and mass conversions. We've seen thousands of people coming to Christ over the course of these years. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brothers. That word unbelieving literally means uh, without persuasion. It can also be translated as disloyal or disobedient Jews. They were disloyal to their true God by rejecting Jesus Christ. And they embittered the Gentiles against them. So that means their minds were poisoned against Paul and Barnabas. This is continuous opposition, and yet again it goes back to the anti-gospel Jewish people. They're the ones that went after Jesus. They're the ones that have gone after the early church, and they continue to go after Paul. Um, Imagine that Paul would have been kind of, he was like the greatest guy against Christianity. Now he's the greatest guy for Christianity. Verse 3, therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. The response, again, it's not to back down. It's not to shy away. It's not cowardice. It's boldness and to stay. 
They had their feet planted firmly, and they were going to stay. Boldness. Now, do you remember back in John uh, in Acts chapter 4, John and Peter pray for boldness. They pray, and now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with complete boldness. They prayed, and we have watched this prayer be answered over and over again through the book of Acts. Paul speaks boldly in Damascus in Acts 9. He also speaks boldly in Jerusalem. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas, they address the crowds in Pisidian Antioch boldly. We just read that a few minutes ago. Here at Iconium, the disciples speak boldly. Apollos will speak boldly in Ephesus. Paul will also speak boldly in Ephesus. And Paul will speak boldly as he goes in front of King Agrippa. They speak boldly and with reliance on the Lord. They're not relying on their own talents, their own knowledge, their own skill, but relying on God himself. We are nothing without Christ, and we rely fully and wholeheartedly on him. And here's what God was doing. Here's what the Lord was doing. The Lord was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be performed by their hands. Signs and wonders are a testimony from God himself to prove that his words are true. Jesus did this when he would heal people and preach to people. Those signs were used to validate the message, and here it continues to happen. And we've seen many signs and wonders, and we're going to see more. Some of them are listed specifically. Some are just like this, saying that there are signs and wonders granted. But the people of the city were divided and sided with the Jews, while others with the apostles. An apostle is someone who has directly been trained by Jesus Christ. We kind of have two categories of apostles here in the book of Acts. There is what we'd say like the capital A apostles, the 11 disciples and Paul. But we also see the other disciples being referred to as apostles So some of the ones who had been around with Jesus, who would have been up in that upper room waiting for Pentecost, are also considered apostles along with the 11 and Paul. But people today who go around proclaiming that they are apostles, they're wrong. You can't get that title today. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was division. And it reminded me of this quote of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. Well, what do you mean, Jesus? You're the prince of peace. You're the, you, you came to make peace. But he says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be the members of his household. You see, the gospel brings peace between man and God. And it does, in times, bring peace between man and man. But it will also divide. And here we see that division as God is breaking down what we call the dividing wall of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. But there is and there will always be division and hostility towards those who proclaim the name of Christ. The thought and wish for world peace is not going to happen in this lifetime. Because as long as there are Christians, as long as there is Christ, there will be those who violently and hatefully oppose him. Verse 5, and when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to treat them abusively and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Laotia, Lystra, and Derbe and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. There have been so many threats and abuse that the apostles and disciples have endured so far in the book of Acts. Here's just a short list. Peter and John, they were arrested questioned and flogged. Stephen was arrested and martyred by being stoned to death. Christians were imprisoned and persecuted by Saul. Paul's life was threatened. James has been executed. Peter was imprisoned. Paul and Barnabas were driven from Pisidian Antioch, and right now they avoid being stoned. Verse 6, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Laconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So they are continuing to make this circuit around Asia Minor. And in Derby, this may have been the time where Timothy was converted to Christianity. He's going to join them on their next missionary journey. But many people believe that it was from 
Paul's journey that he must have met Timothy this first time and he was saved. That speculation, we don't know it for sure, but it's a fascinating little area. And Timothy's going to be a major player eventually in the church of Ephesus. And they go through and it says they continued to preach the gospel no matter what hardship faced them. They continued to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. In Lystra, a man was sitting whose feet were incapacitated. There's, do you remember in Acts 1.8, you will receive power, that Greek word in dynamo. That's where we get our word dynamite, right? So you will be empowered. Well, this is a dynamo, so it's without power. His feet were without power. It was impossible for him to move. He had been disabled from his mother's womb and had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke. Paul looked at him intently and saw that he had faith to be made well. We've seen this before as well when someone looks intently. This was the same when Peter told the lame man to stand up and walk. This is the same as when Paul looked intently on the magician and darkness came over him. Faith to be made well. And he said to him with a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. And the man leaped up and began to walk. There are so many signs and wonders happening in the book of Acts. I want to take a moment just to review. We've seen about 15 of the 20 specific signs and wonders. Started off with the sound of the rushing wind in the upper room and then continued on with the tongues of fire. There's miraculous speech that's speaking in tongues, speaking in other languages. Then the lame man was healed. They prayed for boldness and their building was shaken. Ananias and Sapphira, they sinned against the Holy Spirit and they were suddenly dead. The imprisoned apostles, they were freed by an angel. Philip, after ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch, he's transported instantly about 10 to 20 miles to Azotus. And then we see at Saul's conversion, he sees a bright light and a voice from heaven. Saul is blinded then, and then he's healed. Something like scales falls off his eyes. Aeneas is healed of paralysis. Dorcas, or Tabitha, she is restored back to life. She had died, and three days later, she's back. We saw Herod's violent death when he took God's glory. And then the magician is blinded. And now this crippled person at Lystra has been healed. And we're going to see five more of these specific signs and wonders in the book of Acts. You can find that list at ourdailybread.org. Verse 11, when the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, right? So they, they see this man, he's lame, he could never walk, and now he leaps up. The, the crowd sees it. They raise their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. These acts of the apostles were undeniably supernatural, but some people were still blinded and could not see that it was the one true God performing these divine acts. But they knew it was not just an ordinary person doing this. There was something greater behind it. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes, since he was the chief speaker. Moreover, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. A lot of times when you hear about these Greek and Roman gods, you might hear someone describe them like our modern-day superheroes, like Superman or Batman. But that's not correct. They actually worship them, believing them to be true gods. This is an example of a temple of Zeus outside of Olympus. It's not the temple of Zeus that's referenced here in scripture uh, at Iconium. But there are multiple different temples to these gods. In fact, some of the seven wonders of the ancient world were gigantic temples, marvels of construction that were made to false pagan demonic gods. And you see, when they see what has happened, they want to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they are a god. Right? That, that doesn't happen. If someone makes a citizen's arrest, nowadays, someone doesn't look and say, oh, that must have been Batman. Go get the cows and kill them. Right? They, this, they, they took this seriously as worship. And now part of the reason why, let, let, we'll talk about that. So Zeus was king of the gods. And Barnabas must have looked maybe somewhat athletic or maybe he just had a better personal presentation than Paul. Because remember the name Paul, it just means small. And that there's, there's other comments in the Bible about Paul's size and the way he looks. 
And Hermes was the son of Zeus. He was the messenger of the gods. So that's why they think that Paul and Barnabas are gods. But the people of Lystra had a tradition or a legend that Zeus and uh, Hermes had come down before, and they were looking for hospitality, and they'd gone around and knocked on a thousand doors, and a thousand people turned them away. But finally, this elderly couple took them in. And because of that, the elderly couple were immortalized as oak trees. I guess as immortal as you can be until someone cuts you down. And then they destroyed a thousand of the houses, those thousand houses that rejected them. So that was the legend. And so the people here, they're going into a frenzy because in their minds, well, they don't want their city to be destroyed again, right? Potentially, maybe there had been an attack on the city before and, you know, rulers like to spin these things and they may have lied and said it was the gods. Who knows why they came up with this? But that was the legend and that's what they believed. So now they believe that Zeus and Hermes are back in physical form. And what does that sound, again, like a false version of, a god coming in human form? You see, all false teachings are not as simple as they sound. It's not just, oh, that's just what they believed as a fake god, and they're, you know, they've kind of interesting looking or whatever. But Paul will write in 1 Timothy 4.1 that it's the doctrine and the teaching of demons. So they bring these garlands out to decorate Paul and Barnabas, and they bring oxen out to slaughter them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard about it, they tore their robes and rushed out to the crowd. This is immediate action. Their first action is grief. To tear your robe is a sign of grief. That's what happened if someone came in and said that someone in your family passed away. You would have ripped your clothes. It was a sign of grief. They were grieved over the fact that someone would call them God because they are just mere men and they would not dare to take God's glory. Unlike what we saw happen in chapter 12 with King Herod, who people said that he spoke with the voice of a God and because he didn't give God the glory, an angel of the Lord killed him and he was eaten with worms. They tore their robes, rushed out to the crowd, and crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you. They are not of divine nature, but they are empowered by something supernatural. Preaching the gospel to you. Again, how many times have we heard that just this chapter to proclaim the gospel, to preach the gospel, to evangelize, it's all about the good news of Jesus Christ. Preaching the gospel to you to turn these useless things to a living God. Isaiah 44 has this interesting passage talking about um, false gods and how from the same log you will turn half of it into a god and over the other half you will cook your dinner. My question is what happens if you flip it the wrong way and you accidentally threw your god in the fire? To turn these useless things to a living God. Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them in past generations. And he permitted the nations to go their own way. Again, it's permissive language. And yet he did not leave himself without witness. So here's the witness that God has constantly left. And that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. We call those things common grace. And every person on this planet has received common grace from God. But not everyone will receive that saving grace. For those of us who have received that saving grace, along with common grace, we need to understand just how blessed we truly are. Verse 18, and even by saying these things, only with difficulty did they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. The people listened in part because they thought that Paul and Barnabas were these gods. So they're going to obey the gods. And so if the gods don't want to be sacrificed to, they're not going to do it. But hopefully, maybe some relented from doing this because they saw the truth and they converted to following Jesus Christ. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Here they are again, constantly. Like Paul's on this missionary journey, and they're like a couple steps behind him trying to derail it. Having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. Look at their dedication. We, we talked about how far Paul has had to walk. And these Jews following from town to town, they're walking that distance as well just to stop this message. 
God is always working, but so is Satan. Remember that in your own life. God is working in your personal life, but so is Satan to derail God's message. The Jews come, and they win over the crowds. Do you remember when Jesus came in to Jerusalem? The crowds cheered for him, but by the end, the Jews had won over the crowds, and they shouted to crucify him. This crowd wanted to celebrate and sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, and now they want to stone them. Paul, who had approved of Stephen's stoning, who was an answer to Stephen's prayer as he was being stoned, who avoided being stoned at the previous city, is now stoned himself. And it must have been so bad because they thought that he was dead. They throw rocks at him to get him to stop talking, and they drag him outside the city. Let's see what Paul does next. Remember, like I said, love can make you do crazy things. And love for Christ will make you do things even crazier in the eyes of this world. Many people at this point, they would just be thankful that they're still alive. They're going to go about their way. They ain't getting stoned again. Verse 20. But when the disciples stood around him, Paul got up and he entered the city. They stoned him. They drug him outside the city. But just like the lame man got up, Paul gets up. You see, Paul had been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that power gave him the drive to go from city to city while they hounded at him, while they chased him from cities. And he could not stop proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, so they tried to kill him, and they failed. Later on, To get him to stop talking about Jesus, they would just have to cut his head clean off. To get him to stop proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ, he had to be dead once for all. But little did they know what would happen is that his words and his letters would live on. And thousands of years later, they teach us the truths of Jesus Christ to this very day. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of the gospel. The gospel that empowers us to live life for you. And we thank you that you have given us the desire and the power to do what pleases you. That we don't work on our own. We don't proclaim you on our own. But the Holy Spirit leads and guides us. We thank you for this passage today. That has so many rich truths about you. That we can see the boldness of the apostles. That we can see the tenacity of Paul. And God, we just pray that you would embolden us to be your witnesses as we go about our life that we would tell people about you, that we would not shy away or back down, but that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, you would guide us in the Holy Spirit, you would speak through us in the Holy Spirit, and that we would just be mere vessels for you, conduits to proclaim your word and your truth to this world that so desperately needs it. We give all to you, God, to be empty and clean vessels fit for your use. In your perfect holy name, amen. Church, let's stand and let's sing to God about all that he's done and what we have to offer back to him.